uh, Judges chapter 4, verse 17. So now um, with only a few verses, there's a ton of lessons to learn from JL's life. And um, this is why I wanted to expand on my charge that I had in London. We just came back from the EMC. And, um, and I had a short charge over there. So I wanted to expand on, on that lesson. So the title for my lesson is, When the Enemy Comes to Your Door. Okay. When the Enemy Comes to Your Door. So Judges chapter 4, verse 17. And, uh, okay, we're going to start reading. And I have it here. I'm going to read a different translation, but you guys can follow along. Okay, it says, um, Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. St stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone in there, say no. But J.L. Heber's wife picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wow, right? <laughs> yeah, that's in the Bible. So so Sisera is a is a commander of the Kenite army, Kenanite army of King Jabin. And we don't have time to go through the whole story, but you you guys should read, you know, uh, Judges chapter four or five. It talks about Deborah and but tonight I'm gonna focus on JL, okay? So um Sisera he is an enemy of God's people, okay? And he comes to JL's tent. And what do we know about JL? So, she's bold, right? <laughs> she goes to JL's tent. And at first glance, what we see is that this woman, she drives a tent peg through the temple of a sleeping man. Wow. Which, which at first you can think, that can seem a little heartless. It could seem like, pretty violent <laughs> too, right? right? Yeah, but if you turn to chapter 5, okay, okay so on, turn on. to chapter 5, verse 24. On, it says, Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Most blessed of tent-dwelling women. So she is called the most blessed of women. And the only other woman in the Bible described as blessed above women was Mary, the mother of Jesus. Wow. I found that that's in, in Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 28 and verse 42. And I found that connection to be like, wow, this, this person drives a tent through the temple of a sleeping man. And she's called blessed above all women. And so is the mother of Jesus. It's a great connection, right? right. But also we see that JL's Hebrew name is Jale is it's actually mountain goat. So please don't name your daughter mountain goat, okay? But interestingly, interestingly, that means, that means to be useful. JL's Hebrew name means to be useful. So both Mary and JL were most blessed among women because they were useful to God. They were women that God could work through. When the opportunity to serve God came to them, they did not hesitate to obey him. They were willing and able vessels for God at the time that he needed them. So Mary was useful to God when she was only a teen, right? She was asked to bring Jesus into the world and her plans for her life that she probably thought she had like squared away they were completely changed. She was pregnant and Joseph was obviously not the father. So at the very least, she could have been shunned from the Nazarene society for that, right? And, and just left to starve. But more than likely, she could have been stoned to death for adultery as dictated by the Mosaic law, okay? And that's in Deuteronomy 22, 21. 
So as difficult as that time was for her, she did what God asked her to do. As a teen, she was useful for God. Now, JL wanted to be useful to God, right? She was. She was useful to God when she was bold enough to act by killing the man who stood between um, God's people and the enemy, right? So she um, just decided to end with someone that was an, an enemy of God. So sisters, when we are faithful and we do what God has called us to do, we are useful vessels to God. But in the same way, when we are faithless, we are also useful, but we're useful to, for the enemy. So my first point is brokenness leads to usefulness. Brokenness leads to usefulness. So um, you can turn with me to Psalm 51, verse 17. Like I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a different translation, but you can follow along. It might be the same one in your own Bible, but it says in Psalm 51, verse 17, it says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. So the word for heart in Hebrew refers to the inner man, the inner person, okay, or, or the will, your will. So to have a broken heart means that we are willing to put off the natural person. Wow. It means that we're, we're willing to put off who we are without God. To yield over, to yield our will over to God's will. Okay? So contrite in Hebrew is defined as crushed or dust. Wow. Meaning that when we are contrite, we have developed a willingness to totally submit to God's will. Wow. Having crushed the instincts of the natural person of who we are and completely root them out of our life. So those, those in this you know, spiritual state have recognized that we are less than dust on earth. Okay, that we are ready. We're ready to be obedient to God, those with a contrite and broken heart. So those who are truly contrite choose to, to um, follow the spirit, as uncomfortable as it is, right? And this is what J. Ellen Mary did. It wasn't comfortable to be useful for God, right? Those who have a broken and contrite heart are willing to do anything and everything that God has asked them to do without resistance or resentment. And that, the resentment part is the one that I'm like, ouch. Like, that one hits me, okay? Because we're, when we are this way, when we have a broken and contrite heart, we don't resist and we don't resent. Like, we don't resent God for it, you know? Um, are you doing what God has called you to do without resentment? Like, oh, fine, I'll lead this. Uh, I'll lead the Bible talk. <laughs> uh, I'll disciple her, even though she's tough to deal with. Uh, I'll be giving, even though he doesn't take me out on dates. Uh, I'll be a disciple, but I just want an easier life. It's like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> And I, I want to lift up, I want to lift up Jen Escobar. <laughs> she, she is a woman who has a broken and contrite heart and is useful for God. Um, you know, she was in the San Mateo region when it was first planted. I, I want to say about two years ago, right? Was it a year and a half ago too? Okay. Um, she got married to her awesome husband, Izzy. Israel. Israel, he probably. So they were asked to move to Texas right after they're married, right? Asked to move to Texas. Yeah. And then and then shortly after, just a couple months, then they were they were asked to serve and, and move again back here to SF. And then when they got here, they they had a difficult time finding a place to live. Um, so then they were staying with their awesome mother-in-law, Zoila. Yes. <laughs> And then, and then God moves them again to lead the San Mateo region. It was like full circle, right? And someone would think, man, like, God, why would you have me, like, 
go through all these hoops. Why not just like keep me there? I was there anyway already, right? And you could be like, oh, why? You know, and resentful. Like I moved my life and I did all this stuff and now I'm back to the same place. But she's not like that, you know? She, she chose to not be resistant nor resentful. Why? Because Jen realized that she was dust. Mere dust, entitled to nothing. She's, what makes her great is God, right? She wasn't entitled. She simply wants to hear from Jesus on the last day, well done, good and faithful servant. What does it mean to be a broken, humble woman? And what are some characteristics of a proud, unbroken woman, okay? I don't know about you, but I love lists, okay? Every morning I, try my best to list all the things that I'm grateful for. So I love listing stuff. And, and God love listing, loves listing stuff too. We see that in the Bible. Um, but so, I, you know, my last 24 years as a Christian, I've, I'm going to say a list, okay? And I've struggled with some of these, and some are, I'm still kind of work, I'm working on. Uh, most of them I want to say amen. I've, I've repented of these things. But I want to list uh, some things that describe a proud woman and a broken woman, okay? I'm a, so number one, a proud woman focuses on the failures of others, but a broken woman is focused with the sense of their own need for God. Number two, a, a proud women have a critical fault-finding spirit. They look at everyone else's faults with a microscope, but theirs is seen through a telescope very far. <laughs> broken women, on the other hand, are compassionate towards others who fail. And they can forgive much because they know how much they've been forgiven. Wow. Number three, proud women have to prove that they are right. So they have to get the last word at everything. Where a broken woman is willing to yield the right to be right before God. Wow. Number four, proud, a proud woman um, self-protects. It's like, it, this is my right to have this. But broken women understand the power of self-denial. Number five, proud women want to be served by their husband, their children, and want everyone else to meet their own needs. But broken women are motivated and grateful just to serve others. Number six, proud women have a drive to be recognized and lifted up, and they get hurt when they're not thanked or, or are overlooked. But broken women are willing to serve without expecting anything in, re in return and rejoice when others are lifted up. Number seven, proud people are surfacey. Maybe at, during D group, they're like, pray for my job, pray for my kids, pray for my tough marriage. But that's like everybody. <laughs> pray for my kids, yes. Pray for my marriage. But broken women are specific about their sin. They're not worried about what other people think about them. They're open and transparent as God directs. Wow. Number eight, proud people have a hard time saying these words. I was wrong. Will you just please forgive me? Wow. And they wait for others to ask for forgiveness if there's a conflict. Broken women are quick to find anything and initiate the apology and admit failure and to seek forgiveness when necessary. Proud people keep others at arm's length. But broken women are willing to risk getting close to others and take the risk of loving intimately, knowing that they can probably get hurt. Number 10, the last one. Proud women don't like correction through the word of God. But broken women are convicted by the Bible and are quick to repent because she understands that sin breaks God's heart. Wow. So if you turn with me to Matthew 5.3, it's a very common scripture. Matthew 5 3. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the word poor is not just someone financially poor, right? In the Greek, the word poor means utterly, absolutely destitute, poverty stricken. It's like you have no help no hope no way of making it unless someone doesn't reach down and lift you up from the gutter wow. okay it's like a point of complete and utter you need help wow. so poor 
dust, nothing. We are nothing apart from Jesus. That is, that is a poor in spirit. That's, and, and that's so like counterintuitive of what society tells us, right? <laughs> that's not what we're used to. Society wants us to be like, no, I am strong and I am, yeah, with Jesus, <laughs> right? Jesus is like, blessed are the broken ones, those who realize that they're bankrupt apart from God and his grace. God draws near to the broken one, but he's stiffed arm to the proud. You feel you're not close to God right now? Maybe it's because you're a prideful woman. God hates pride in every form. Sisters, it's time to acknowledge our absolute need for God. So for some practicals, there is no brokenness where there is no openness. So maybe some of the women here who are married, maybe you need to tell your husband, I've been such a proud, self-righteous, critical woman. I've been holding you to my own standard. Or maybe that's not you because maybe you're not married. <laughs> maybe you need to talk to your disciple or your roommate and apologize for not being grateful for them, for their prayers, for their love, for their time. Maybe you need to apologize to God for fill in the blank. I don't know what it is. And do the very thing that you know God wants you to do, but your flesh is telling you not to do. <laughs> so Mary and JL were blessed because they were broken. And this led to being used by God and not being used by the enemy. So let's be women who are useful vessels for God. Okay, point number two. Point number two is put, put a nail through it. That's point number two. Put a nail through it. So Judges uh, chapter four. And we're going to go back to what we were reading before. In verse, in verse 17. And it says, um, it's the part where it says, Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, because there was an, an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber, the Kenite. Okay, so it points out that Jael's husband had an alliance with King Jabin. I don't know if you caught that. This isn't good. <laughs> an alliance? with the bad person, <laughs> with the bad guy, right? Her husband was basically on the fence. He was with God's people, but he was also with the enemy. So JL's husband was struggling, you know, or he was definitely weak in some of his convictions. But what did this produce in his wife? How was JL affected by this? Was JL on the fence too? Was JL struggling too? No. Right, let's, a few things about JL. JL was a nomad, meaning her and her husband didn't have a fixed or permanent place to live, okay? So the nomads were someone that would move. They would travel. They would pick up their tent and, you know, put their tent in somewhere else depending on food or enemies, okay? So as a nomadic woman, JL and most of the women would have been used to carrying heavy things, okay? They had heavy loads, and they were used to doing the practical things of getting the getting the tent up okay they didn't book airbnbs they didn't have a u-haul they couldn't call someone hey come uh brothers come and help me move my stuff please like they didn't do that it was actually the women you know one of jl's duties as a woman was to pitch the tent at every new location so she was used to hammering tent pegs you know she was used to hammering these things to the ground and um you know and and she had to do a lot of muscle like you know like hard labor and in a way she had been preparing her whole life for this moment for this moment with Cicera without even knowing it like her her preparation was disguised as her ordinary life it was part it was part of her everyday activity so god was preparing her for when the enemy would come to her door you know, and um, JL could have found all kinds of excuses, though. She could have been like, you know what? My husband's struggling, so I'm not going to I'm not going to give that much. <laughs> you know, I'm she could have just been like, I'm tired. I'm tired. I've I've already served enough. Let someone else do it or I'm too busy or I'm too young or I'm too old. 
I'm limited, you know, and this is where I hear a lot, like, oh, I'm limited, you know, because I have my kids, or I'm limited because I have a child with special needs, I do, or I'm, I, or I'm limited because I have an ailment, uh, you know, I'm just a tent dweller. That's what she was called, a tent dweller. Yeah. She was basically a stay-at-home mom. Wow. wow. But, or JL could have also been like, I'm just going to join Cicero. Like, maybe he's going to come and he just could leave, <laughs> you know? Like, I could just house him here for a little bit and then I can just, like a conflict avoider, right? Yeah. Or she could have yeah. just drank warm goat's milk herself and just tucked herself in too and just laid down next to him and just slept through God's calling. Mm. But but her limitation became her strength wow. to kill the enemy. Wow. And I want you to see that it's not the kids. It's not the kids. It's not your full-time schedule as a college student. It's not your full-time schedule as a you know working professional. Your your limitation is your unwilling spirit. Wow. Your attitude. Your attitude limits you more than your situation. Wow. So sometimes your limitations can be your greatest gift to fulfill your destiny in Christ. And it's right in front of you. When sin comes to your door, are you putting a nail through it? Or are you using your limitation to keep the sin around the house? Are you making excuses for yourself? JL was fearless. She was decisive. JL took action on the opportunity that God brought to her very door. She didn't look for someone else to do the job for her. She didn't question her qualifications or suitability for the task, you know, that was in front of her. She was like, I'm straight up going to nail him <laughs> in the head. This sin is going to be gone, right? And there are a couple of things I want us to see of how she attacked the sin in her life. Okay, number one, she did the opposite of what the enemy asked of her. Okay, he says, please give me some water. What did she do? She opened a skin of milk. <laughs> she gave him milk and then she covered him up with a blanket. <laughs> right. What does that sound like? Yeah, she's tucking him in like a like a mom giving giving her baby milk for what? For, his, for him to go to sleep. Right. You're hoping that you're feeding your baby milk. It's like, oh, he's going to go down for a nap or he's going to go down to sleep. So she had a purpose for what she was doing. She was intentional. She's like, I'm going to give this guy milk and I'm going to put him to sleep and then I'm going to destroy the sin. <laughs> sin is not your friend. Sin is ruthlessly violent towards you and me. Sisters, when the enemy and the flesh ask things of us, we need to do the opposite. Yeah. It sounds very basic, right? Yeah. But sometimes we so easily just give in and we don't do the opposite. Right. We need to be, I'm not going to give you what you want. Yeah. You know, when you're tempted to sin in your anger and be unloving or disrespectful, sometimes you know what you need? You need to take a deep breath. Right. <laughs> There's even studies on this. Sometimes you need to breathe. Yeah. It's like, <sighs> instead of being, ah, you did this to me. It's like you need your brain, your lungs. You need to give yourself some time. Sometimes, you know what I do? I'm like, you know what, Fernando? I just need a hug. <laughs> I'm on my emotions and I'm like, okay, you know what this is? I just need a hug. And you may not be this way, okay? But I know some sisters are. Sometimes you just need a, a break. You just need a hug. <laughs> and he's like, uh. <laughs> you know. He's a rational person. He wants to talk through everything. <laughs> I want to hug. Okay. Or, or maybe, you know, you're tempted to, to look at impure websites, you know, or, or to be impure or to call a boy from your past. You need to offer the opposite. You need to call a sister. Sis, I am tempted to call my ex-boyfriend right now. And I know that that is bad news. Okay. 
you know, or instead of watching a crazy website, watch one of Michelle Williamson's sermons. Go do it! You know, or go out for a walk. Sometimes you just need fresh air. Just go out for a walk and call on the Lord, guys. Okay, or you can put safeguards on your phone. There's so much stuff right now that can keep you away from these crazy things on your phone, but you just don't want to do it. And you can totally do it. Or you could confess at a temptation level. And then, you know. So, okay, so number two, another thing that we see her do to attack is JL used what she had in her tent to kill the enemy. The King James Version says that she put her hand to the nail and she smoked the enemy. She smoked. So smoke means, smoke means to strike. To sound the alarm. Smoke reminds me of that movie that yes. Mimi likes. Smoke, smoke in. You know what I mean? That movie? Yeah. yeah. Like Moana. So, smoke means to strike, to sound the alarm. If you think about it, tent nails, they hold the tent in place against the wind. The nails anchor the tent, it keeps it in place. The tools, the hammer and the nail, that she used can represent to us the word of God. In Jeremiah 23, you guys can turn there or you can hear, you can just listen. But Jeremiah 23 verse 29, it says, Does not my word burn like fire, says the Lord. It is not like, isn't it not like a mighty hammer that smashes the most stubborn rocks to pieces? Man, the word of God is powerful, right? God's word is the nail. Sisters, when the enemy comes to your door, when unexpected wind comes to distract you and take your eyes off of Jesus, you must be ready with strong tent nails of conviction, strong conviction to put through these things. You have to have them ready. You have to have the nail ready to just, be anchored against the enemy Mm -hmm. to keep you held to hold you in place we can't allow the enemy's voice to be louder than god's so many people use poor substitutes to hold things together okay like glue glue okay some of you okay i get my nails done once in a while i don't like spending too much money on them but my nail broke and I was like you know looking at the reviews what's good uh nail glue and I'm looking down and I'm like oh wow that's good oh only two dollars I should have known two dollars ain't gonna hold my nail down I broke it and I was like okay let me just use nail I was at the I, I go to this like weightlifting class and I'm like picking up the and then all of a sudden poof, poof, and it goes like right right in front of the of the instructor's face they're like <laughs> And then someone grabs it and is like, is this yours? And I'm like, yeah. I put it back in my pocket. I was so embarrassed. Glue, it just doesn't work. And if it works, it's temporary. Duct tape. Some people use duct tape to hold things together. It's not strong enough. It's cheap. But God, you know what God used? God used nails. The nails that went through Jesus' wrists and feet were about six inches long. When the nails were used to hold Jesus in place, it was to hold him down, but it wasn't only that. It was to hold down the power of sin over our lives. The nails were there to when we said Jesus is Lord, It was killing the sin in our lives. So that's like great power over sin that nails have. Okay. And sadly, recently um, we saw, this this is very sad, but we saw a couple fall away from God and they were leaders. And leaders can fall, you know, and this is why we don't make leaders our God. We don't make leaders our God. We don't make our husbands our God. We don't make a boy our God. We don't make our kids our God. We, God is God. 
But the enemy attacked their home. The enemy attacked the spouse. And one of them allowed sin to come in, and he didn't kill it. The other spouse then didn't, then weakened her convictions and ran to the world. And they both sadly fell away. The wife saw signs of sin. She saw the enemy at her door. But she didn't sound the alarm. She didn't say or she didn't say or do anything. But she ran away from God. And she became useful to the enemy. Sisters, choose to put a nail through anything that is trying to keep you from your God. What sin does the enemy have at your door? And have you allowed this sin to move into your house? Unforgiveness, pride that you call insecurity, an unsubmissive spirit, you need to put a nail through it. Are you filled with worries? Are you filled with complaints? Put a nail through it. Are you, baking, are you breaking boundaries with someone at work? It starts with one little slight, slight open of the door. I've been there as a baby Christian. You open your boundaries just for a little bit, and then it just goes a long way. Are you breaking boundaries with a brother or with a boyfriend here in the kingdom? Um, turn to um, Hosea chapter 2, verse 19. If you're breaking boundaries, guys, it starts with one step at a time. It's like one little tiny thing. In Hosea verse 2, I mean chapter 2, verse 19. It says, I'm going to read, I think it's the NLT version. It says, I will take you to be my wife forever. I will take you to be my wife in righteousness, in justice, in love, and in compassion. Guys, don't cheat on God. Wow. Don't cheat on God. On. It's so special. We are special because we are the bride of Christ. Put a nail through it if you're breaking boundaries. Sisters, when the enemy comes to your door, be faithful. Be bold like JL and put a nail through it. Point number three, last point. Uh, listen to their cry for help. Listen to their cry for help. Judges, uh, back to Judges chapter 4. And I'm going to read, um, in starting in verse 3, it says, Because he, which is Sisera, had 900 iron chariots and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Remember that um, Sisera, the commander of the army, had been sent by King Jabin to oppress God's people, Okay. So the scripture tells us that the agent, this agent of cruel oppression was Sisera. This went on for 20 years, living under the oppression. So you could imagine the desperation. It's like 20 years is a long time. If you think about it, you know, like since 2000 for us, you know, or 2020, we're in 2020 now. But could you imagine like how long it could have been? Maybe some of you guys wouldn't have even been born. Some of you guys are probably <laughs> younger than 20 years. But you could imagine the desperation, the hopelessness. Um, and this was going on throughout their life. And those two words, cruel oppression, what does that mean? It marked a time of fear, of great fear. And um, if you look at Judges chapter 5, just go to the next chapter, verse 8. It says, when new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? This time, um, during this time, was when they didn't have enough weapons to fight for themselves. And the 900 chariots, what they represented was something that was too big for God to handle. Wow. They were like, God can't take care of this. This is too big for God. Sometimes we can be that way. Sometimes we could, and this is who we can be without God. We can live in fear. We can think that problems are too big for God to handle. You know, but remember that God has chosen us to deliver other women in this world. God heard the Israelites cry. And what was the help that he sent? He sent Jael. He sent Jael every night. 
across the Bay Area, there's hundreds of women who are crying out for God, for, you know, his help and deliverance. And, and the problem is that we can easily forget that that's who we were too, <laughs> right? We can think, we can think, oh no, but they just look so, because, you know, they, they have a facade and I was like that, right? And uh, sometimes we can think that they're okay because their Instagram account shows them really nice and pretty and they're super filtered. But that's, that's, <laughs> that's just a glimpse. That's just a glimpse. And I can preach this because I was that way too. You know, and I know that a lot of you guys were that way too. But the problem is that we easily forget and we start to think, oh man, but they look so happy. No. They look so carefree. It's like Psalm 73. No. Pride is their necklace, you know? But remember, remember, and I have a heart for that because I was that way. I needed help. I needed a jail. And God put a jail, God put a disciple in my life that helped me. So we all have our own stories, okay? So, but the answer that God has sent is that he can actually use you as a JL wow. through the power of the word of God through Jesus we can actually be a JL in other people's lives wow. right so we have seven weeks left in the year seven weeks that's it and it's done <laughs> God's perfect number of completion is seven so seven seven uh, weeks left I have two challenges for us tonight as we close out Okay, one, make it your ambition to be used by God to bear fruit before the end of the year. Pray specifically for you to meet someone that wants to be delivered. Number two, be sacrificial with your time and special missions to support the planting of more churches around the world. Go above and beyond. So uh, practicals, every day pray for boldness to be a worker, the worker that God desires. Number two, every day make a commitment to share your faith wherever you go. Make every effort to have a friend to study the Bible with or to come visit you at your Bible talk or to come to church on Sunday. Remember that God has chosen you to be the answer to the cries of those around us with and through God. So sisters, we are those who are broken and useful for God. We are those who don't enjoy sin's company. We put a nail through it. And we are those who listen to the cry for help and do something about it. When you and I imitate the heart of JL, we will keep the enemy away from our door. I love you guys. To God be the glory.